everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Chris Yee. I'm Mike Delicio. And today we're looking, taking a look at two games. We're taking a look at both Mike's most anticipated game of 2021 <laughs> and 2022. This is true. Woo. Wow, this is going to be a double-decker review. This is going to be something. <laughs> it's, just, it's because the game was delayed and yeah. then came out this year. And it finally came out. Uh, almost <laughs> was Mike's anticipated game for 2023. Almost. This close. <laughs> this close. Um, and this winner is uh, the designer is, I think, one of the reasons you were interested in it, right? That's certainly one of the reasons I was interested. Yeah, I, I've uh, liked a number of Stan's Stan games. Stan has done a lot of different games. He did the, well, a lot of different games. Look them up on here. Yes, Rurik, Old West Impresario, there Dice Hospital, Lock Up, Block, Lock Up a lot of games that we've enjoyed, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I like a lot of his games, too. And mm -hmm. a cool theme, and the Micho's artwork. A lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of things to like about this. Sure. So... Knowing is we all went in with fairly high expectations. I actually went in with almost no expectations because yeah. Mike's talked about it so much. <laughs> I thought, I don't really know anything about it. I'll just let the game speak to me. And I have more to say about that, but I'm going to save that till we get to our final thoughts. Well, first, Mike will show us how to play the game. Here we go. Okay, here we see a setup for a game of Endless Winter, Paleo-Americans. This is shown up as a two-player game. And in the game, what you're going to be doing is playing through four rounds. Each of those are going to be uh, composed of the main action taking a section. And then in Eclipse phase, you'll do that four times. Whoever has the most points at the end of those four rounds is going to be the winner of the game. The game plays out in a relatively procedural way. You've got a player aid card here that's going to show you everything uh, that you need for the basic turn structure. However, one thing I do want to point out before we get started is that I am not showing you here in this setup either these rest tokens or these glacier tokens. We'll be talking about those in the actual review portion of the uh, of the video. So when you hear us talking about that, that is these. I did not show them here in this initial setup. They are technically variants of the game. All right, so according to this turn order card here, or this actually a uh, kind of player aid card, the first thing that you would do on your turn is if you have any culture cards in your hand, you can play those. So looking at my starting hand of five cards here, you can tell the culture cards because they've got this little symbol up here in the left. This is an era one culture card. In the second two rounds of the game, you'll have era two cards. The market for them is out there. So if I wanted to, I could play this altars card right now. Basically, it would let me pay a tool to put out a monolith. So let's say I did that. My tools are uh, tracked here. My food is tracked here. I would play a tool or pay a tool, and I'd be able to place one of these monolith tokens out there on this board. This board is where the monolith tokens go, and generally speaking, what they allow you to do is get either uh, goods by covering up the spots with those associated goods, in that case, B2, or once there are a number of those tokens out, you can place on the second level if you're going over four other ones, and that would be getting you points. So, first thing you can do on your turn is you can play a culture card. Then you're gonna be doing the main heart of the game, which is placing one of your three figures out, your two regular workers and your chief here, which is the only mini. And you're gonna be placing it onto one of these four action spots on the board. So, from left to right, you have the initiate actions, the develop actions, the migrate actions, and the hunt actions. And they all are gonna work generally in the same way, in that there's a top, middle, and then a bonus spot for each of those four areas. The top part, which is in white, you can do this as many times as you want. The little infinity sign lets you know that. You can do it as many times as you want, as much as you can afford. This middle section, you can do once, optionally, of course. And then if you're the first to go to one of those four areas, you're gonna get the associated bonus at the bottom. So you're never blocking a complete area from another player, but if you're the first to go there, you'll get a bonus for doing so, and so that might incentivize you to do that. Notice also, I mentioned you have a, a uh, chief, basically, that you can put out. Everyone gets a chief card at the beginning of the game. There's a number of them out, of them out there. They are double-sided at the beginning of the game. You choose which side you want. And this particular chief, anytime you place him out, you can do this associate action, which is trade a food for a uh, tool. Some of the chiefs, like Chief Looking Hand here, will only trigger their ability if you go to one of the specific four areas, all right? So you can place any of your workers out, do the associated actions, and then again, if you're the first one, get that bonus. What do these action spots do in a 
overall uh, manner. So in the initiate part, what you're doing there is you're mostly gaining these tribe cards, all right? These are the same five tribe cards that are gonna be in every game, and all of these decks are composed of the same cards. You start with one in your hand, but they are ways to give you better abilities, better, um, Eclipse abilities, which I'll talk about in a moment, also can make some of your other uh, actions more strong. So this one is mainly a place to get new tribe cards or to bury them under this card, which could get you points at the end of the game. The second area, which is the develop area, is where you're primarily gonna be gaining these cards, those culture cards that I showed you at the beginning, which is one of the first things that you would do on your turn. These are going to be giving you uh, some nice abilities that you can use and definitely will add to kind of the asymmetric nature of the game. It allows you to do other things people don't. To pay for those, you're having to use those hand symbols, which mean labor, okay? And so cards in this game are relatively multi-use. You can either play them for what their ability says, uh, on the card, or you can use them for their labor. And so you'll see all of these cards have either one or one and a half uh, labor uh, symbols. So if I wanted to go here and get one of these culture cards, I'd have to spend three labor. I could do that by spending, for example, these two cards. That would get me the three labor I need, but I wouldn't be able to trigger these other abilities of the card. So you have to kind of know how you want to use your cards. You want to use them for the labor. Do you want to use them for their abilities? All right, so that's going to be getting your culture cards and your sacred stones, okay? So this also allows you to gain one of these. For the first two rounds of the game, you can only choose from the left side. In the last two rounds, you can choose from any of them. If you do them, you take them and you pay the associated cost, which is going to be a tool and then increasing amounts of food. And these are ways that you can score points during the eclipse phase, which again, I will talk about in a moment. The third column there, the migrate, is going to be utilizing this board here, which is randomly set up at the beginning of the game with some constraints. You're going to have at least one of every type of terrain out there. But it's a way for you to place out your tents. You start with at least one tent on the board. Some startup cards will allow you to have more. But you'll be eventually placing more tents onto this map and moving them around with the ultimate goal of trying to gain uh, the superiority, the majority on these, to get some abilities and boons during the eclipse phase. If at any point you are able to have three tents that have a nexus in the middle, kind of a central point, if you take this action, you can spend three food to replace those with one of your villages, and then these would come back onto your board. At that point, this is gonna be giving you two influence on every tile that it touches. Otherwise, each tent gives you one influence on that tile. Again, that will come into play more in the eclipse phase. The final spot you can go to is hunting, and that's where you're gonna be focusing on this little board right here, which is your the, the animals board, the hunting board. You can pay some labor to bring new cards into the display if you want to first, and then you can spend a tool and a labor to gain one of these cards to put down into your into display. Now, for the purposes of this, I actually started with a couple of animals. Sometimes you'll start with multiple animals, sometimes you'll start with just one, but this is basically a set collection aspect of the game. If you don't ever tip an animal, which means turn it on its side to get whatever it tells you to do, you're gonna get set collection bonuses at the end of the game. So in the case of this Glyptodon here, if I were to have four or more of these untipped at the end of the game, that would get me 10 points. You can see it's kind of incremental scoring there. They all work generally the same way. This particular animal is a wild animal and it can go into any of your sets unless you have tipped it. Um, if you do tip it, you're gonna get this idle movement here, which I have not mentioned. That's the last board that you see out here. This is the idle board. And when you get this benefit that shows that, you can move up one spot on either of these two boards, uh, uh, two sides of this board, I should say. This is also related to end game scoring. This is gonna be giving you points based upon cards you have in your burial pile and the ratio of leftover resources to points for end game scoring. So everyone's gonna take their three actions, then you're gonna go to the eclipse phase. The eclipse phase, 
is going to be uh, also a bit procedural, where at the end of your last turn in a round, so after you've placed your third uh, piece, whether it's your chief or a regular worker, any additional cards that you have in hand, you can play face down above your board to be an eclipse pile. And that is really mostly about determining turn order for the next round. So once everyone has, has revealed how many cards they have and how much labor they show because that's going to be the, the determining factor you would readjust turn order you would get a number of bonuses based upon that based upon where you are here you're going to get either the bonus you're at or anything lesser that is something that is in the game which is called lesser benefits anytime you get a benefit you can always get something lower down on the list of priority. So you'll get some uh, benefits there. You'll get some benefits uh, from cards that you've played. So any cards that you've played that have a Eclipse bonus, like here, if they were in your Eclipse pile, you would get those bonuses. You would get any bonuses from having the majority on these tiles. And then you're also gonna get benefits based upon things you remove from your board. So in this case, I would be able to draw a card, I would get a tool, and I would also initiate this scoring during the Eclipse phase. That's the structure of a full round. You're going to do that four times. At the end of the game, you're going to be determining uh, who has the most points. Again, you're going to be referring to this idle board to determine who is going to get the most points for their cards in their burial pile and for their resources left over. Whoever has the most points at the end is the winner of Endless Winter Paleo Americans. Let's head back over and let you know what we think. Okay, I'm going to say something right now before we start. <laughs> You're I like getting the this first game. point in. No, I like this game, uh -huh. and I want to make that clear because I'm going to get comments that say I don't like this game because I want to point out a few things compared to Mike's undying love for the game. It's going to look like I hate the game. Leading but the I witness, don't. Your Honor. Objection. It is, it is leading, leading the witness. witness. But I'm getting this in there. I like the game. Okay. I have issues with the game, Tom. I oh, mean, you do? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's a perfect game by any means, but I, I mean, how do we want to start this? What well, okay. would be the first, the first point Well, the you'd first like thing I want to say is as cool as everything is, and I think the components are amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some of the stuff doesn't matter. Um, like, for example, I don't think I tried... And in, in, in the game last night, I tried a different setup of those... Oh, of the, of the board. The tile things. Mm -hmm. I don't think that matters... I mean, yes, technically, it's what I call pseudo randomness, mm -hmm. where there's randomness, but also who cares? We're talking about the the, the, the boards the, where you put your monoliths on, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and it's interesting though. They do say by player count they have suggested layouts, so there no, must but there's be... like no, they're just they're just. If you look at those suggested layouts, they're just like ooh, a pinwheel, a square, okay. um, a bird. Yeah, that's yeah my favorite it's, part. it's not that big of a deal. That's sure. my favorite part about that is like. This looks like an old symbol of, mm -hmm. you know, something like a Paleolithic person would have designed. Yeah. That's about it. Right. But I do like the mechanism. Yeah, it's, 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 it's extra setup in a game that I think has a good amount of setup already. Yeah. The miniatures are amazing. The miniatures are great. The art is great. Miniatures artwork is always good, but I think this might be his best. Best work. I mean, it's pretty up there. This is. He did a lot of art in this, this game. This is in the top tier, I, and I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think this might be my his favorite, uh, you know, example of his. He really created a world here. I think it's, uh, a, it's a great setting. There's a mm -hmm. lot of stark white, mm -hmm. but it doesn't look plain. You know, that's a hard thing to pull off. Yeah. I, I like the look of it. My only complaint about the miniatures for the chiefs is, and it's a, it's a smaller complaint is that when you use a chief out as to to take the yeah. the action spots if you cover up the bonus with them it kind of cuts off the visibility of the board they are a little fat they are they're a little yeah. fat right it, that's a, probably only an issue in your first game or two because the four action spots are pretty easy to memorize yeah. but when you're first playing and someone <laughs> blocks sure. a chunk of the board you're like, what um, is that yeah overall i think the production amazing is amazing miniatures yeah the, the miniatures are very good um so yeah my only so on that same note, I think there's no theme. The only theme mm -hmm. I might argue that there is, is you get to eat animals. So that's kind of cool. And I guess there's the whole people die, although they don't really know how they die. They just die. You stick them underneath the card. We but, made up a story for each one of them when we yeah, played. I, I don't know murder. that it's, I mean, to me, it's as thematic as I would expect a Euro to be. It's a Euro game. I understand that, but I mention it because if you walk by and see this in the store, you'd be mm -hmm. like, and this winter, it has this idea of, going out on adventures. This is straight up a mechanical, very mechanical game. Mm -hmm. um, I just think, but I think that needs to be said because 
I didn't know anything about the game going in. Right. I looked at it, loved the design, I looked at everything, and I was like, ooh, endless winter. And I was like, oh, oh, I had to like reorient myself in my mind. This is just a straight up Euro everywhere. It is. Before we get to that, I'm, I, I do want to say one thing about the production is that while I agree that the production is very, very good, uh, if you walk by the table, you've mentioned this a number of times, yeah, it's going to look beautiful because it's about 18 feet long. It's a huge table hog gigantic table hog everyone has their own player board you've got if you choose to use the play mats there are two different types of play mats because it was kind of divisive during the campaign one if you use a single play mat it's going to take up most of this table uh or you can do it side by side that is an issue uh I, it, table it, it hog is. is something to mention especially it, it in a game that's a deck builder and area control and moving up on a track right so there's you can't have everything in front of you so you better hope everyone else will help yeah there is that yes. now for the thematic aspect of it for, for one reason or another, this game has already been, and I think will continue to be compared to Arnak and Dune. Do you think that it is less thematic than those two games? I think it's less thematic than Dune, yes. Probably. I don't think Arnak has a theme. Right, okay, okay, it has so, an exploration theme. Right. I think they both have themes, yeah. but yes, I'd put it in the same camp as All Arnak. Right, oh, okay. I'm exploring a spider mm. monster or whatever. I, whatever. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. All right. Mm. Okay, well, on the topic of theme, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about how silly it is, I, I honestly, to compare it to Dune and, and yeah, Arnak. It's very be. different games. You but the thing with theme for me is I feel like this is kind of like Caverna to me, in the sense that Caverna has a cool theme, and it's mostly just a Euro game, mm -hmm. but the theme does help you orient yourself on the different actions. I agree with that. And so it's not extremely thematic, but it's thematic enough that it's not, uh, it's not counterintuitive. This is the hunting animal spot. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? You're affecting the animal part of the board. The I agree on comes, that. The theme comes through for me, but not in an exciting way, in a yeah. good way. I would yeah. argue there's no theme on that land board, though. Well, Three tents do not turn into a... Um, um, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they do. If more you, people show up. If you build up population in an area, the towns form. I mean, it's... Yeah, ish. But, I mean, they're not people. They're tents. I, I get it. People live Who in built tents. the tents, Tom? <laughs> Aliens. That's okay. who. I don't care. You have to put... You have to make the theme. The game doesn't provide the theme. You're providing. Mm. I, I blatantly disagree, mm. but it's not a it's not a <laughs> theme first experience. It's I'm in a between you two on, on this wild spectrum. I'm in the middle there, but uh, but yeah, I do think that, that that it certainly is not counterintuitive. The theme does not work against the mechanisms, but it's also not the heaviest thematic game I've played. So this is where this is my slight negative about the game, and I think people need to know this uh, coming in is. The mechanisms of the game, mm -hmm. this is a very, very procedural game. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't played one like this in a while. That I that took me a while kind of to say, okay, this is how the game works. Okay. I like all the different stuff. There's deck building. There's area control. There's co uh, set collection. There is um, oh, um, card play mm -hmm. to do different things. I don't know that there's almost anything particularly unique. I know you'll say the clip phase, but I don't think that's particularly unique. There's other games that also, sure. like Kemet has a night phase that yeah, you get yeah. stuff in there too. Mm -hmm. And it works really well, okay? I think the game is extremely balanced. Um, it does a lot of stuff. But at times, it for me, and this is what keeps me from, I'm not, not to spoil my score too much, but from instead of giving it excellent, I'm giving it good. Mm -hmm. At times, it feels a little clinical mm. to me. To do all this stuff, there's a lot going on, and some of the stuff, you know, when you talk about theme, like the, the least thematic part of this game is those, um, the, the, what do they call the squares you put in to get the monolith. The, the monoliths, that, that doesn't make any sense at all. You yeah, know, that's very mechanical. That's, sure. it's, it's very mechanical, and again, it works, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I don't know. I, I came off slightly cold on that, mm. which keeps me from going excellent on this. Well, it's interesting you say the, it. The, the 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 cold. Yeah, it's interesting I, I don't you, make puns. you say the the procedural elements because while I agree that there's a strict structure to first you play your culture cards, then you play. So that I agree with. But within that, I think there's a lot of freedom because you can play cards that give you. You can choose when to play your cards. You know, you can say, oh, I'm going to use this for uh, for labor, or I'm going to use this for its ability, or I'm going to save this and use it during the eclipse phase. So I think there's a lot of flexibility, and even when you've got multiple actions that you can take, you as a player can choose the order that those actions occur. That, it's a double-edged double sword. One, it can lead to a little bit of analysis paralysis because you're, like, trying to be optimal. But it does give you a lot of freedom. So 
while the round structure, I agree, it's like, yeah, you, you have to remember, play your culture cards first, then you take your actions, then you set up your eclipse pile if it's the last turn uh, of that round. That I agree with, but I feel like you have a lot of agency as a player, a lot of agency, and all of these disparate elements do come together well, and I don't feel like one of them is weaker than others. I think that the deck building is animals. spot on. No, I think the animals are great. Okay, no, but I did learn that if you just go straight animals, you may not win. If you go straight <laughs> anything, I think, you, you do have to diversify a little bit. You now. do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so. Which is I, which is fine, I love mm -hmm. that. I love not having not being beholden to one of the four actions. Oh, right. I go there again. Mm -hmm. there's, a lot, it, there's a lot of fun to be had in those four different actions sure. because, well, I guess fifth, because you mentioned also resting. Resting, yeah. Resting, is basically a fifth action. Mm -hmm. And yet I find each one compelling. I think that's really good because mm -hmm. there's only you know four spots in the center board to go to. I love that little procedurality to it. I think because they're grouped. Mike, you made a good point when we were talking about this. Uh, you you kind of compared it to Feast for Odin. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite games where there's blocks of actions, they're all kind of grouped by these are the animal actions, these right. are the raiding actions, and so it's kind of shorthand that makes it easier as a player to uh, to kind of say, okay, if I go to this spot, what are the things that I'm going to do? It doesn't feel like a checklist of five different things. Right, it right. feels like... They're all related. Related things. Mm -hmm. I like that action system a lot. Do the top part as many times as you want in any order. Do the middle part once. Maybe get a bonus. Right. And those bonuses, they're juicy, but they're not overly powerful, right. but they will inform your decision because you say, well, I, I could get a free food and tool if I go to this spot. I wasn't planning on going there this yet. This time. Yeah, yeah, right. But it might inform my decision, and that's the right level of bonus to kind of entice me. Right. No, that, I, I, I do agree on that. I like all that stuff. Now, this game came with a lot of expansions. Mm -hmm. I haven't played any of them. I probably... I shouldn't say I won't. I don't know. I might get around to them. Mike will play them all. I'll and play them at some all. point, yeah, but not yet. But, and I feel very strongly about this, yeah. <laughs> in the box there are two tiny little modules, modules they, they call them. Variant modules, yeah. I will never play without them. Just I put feel them like in. both of them matter a lot. Yeah. One of them turns the ice fields into something worth going to, mm -hmm. which I think is very useful, especially if the board, if you watch our live playthrough, we did it, there was like a whole section, it was just kind of useless. Yeah, you, it was, and that, the, the glaciers blocked you off from... Yeah, yeah. so that makes it less useless. Mm -hmm. And the other is the resting thing that gives you an extra bonus when you rest, and oh my word, that if makes the, the game so one. much better. If you're the first. Yeah. Which, again, is that same, you know, you mentioned that juicy makes bonus to go for, decision, yeah. and then... Wow, and they're not hard. It's no. really weird to me why those two things were removed because the game already has like 80 rules. I don't think 82 is a huge change. I'm a little confused, right? Because they do seem to be like no-brainers. Put them in. Put them in in the first game. You know what I mean? It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. There's no more cognitive load there uh, because you're not doing different things. You know, the, those things that you're doing on the glacier tiles are the same types of things you're doing elsewhere. They're the same kind of bo boons and bonuses. So yeah, put them in. They they, they do. For make me, it's the a game. whole point. Rating value difference. Mm, mm. That's how much I think they're important. Yeah. Wow. Because it made the rest action net much more interesting. Right. And you may made it so everyone rested every turn. At least one person every rested every turn. Every turn, someone round. rested yeah, because right. it was that the bonus was that good. <laughs> right. Um, resting was already a good action. Mm -hmm. It's one of the it better is. resting in a game actions. And I think that's one that you only see that either towards the end of your first game or in subsequent games. You don't think, I don't think you realize how powerful the rest action can be until you've seen the Eclipse phase work a couple of times. I think you we're accustomed to, hey, center board, I can't really do anything that useful, but I'll go to this spot because right. I'll get like an animal. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, that rest action is, is good and I like it in a game where that doesn't feel like a waste. Like, okay, draw one card. Yeah. You know, I don't feel like there are it. typically wasted turns in this game. There are turns that are maybe less efficient. There are turns where you get annoyed because someone took the bonus you wanted, but you're still going to be able to do <laughs> something of consequence on every turn, I think. And Absolutely. having a different chief helps you feel a little sure. asymmetrical. Just a after, little, which, well, is after, good, which is good. Well, after one turn, you're very asymmetrical. Yeah, that's true. You're getting those cu culture cards that nobody else has. Right. You, yes. you know, you have a, a different deck than other mm -hmm. people do. Although, as a as a quick aside, this is a deck building game, mm -hmm. but it feels like yet another iteration of deck building mm -hmm. to the point where, let's say you say, I hate deck building games, I might go, this doesn't particularly feel like that strong of a deck building game because you 
get almost all your cards a lot. You there's lots of ways to draw cards. Yeah. You go through. I shuffled every turn. Mm -hmm. You know, I just felt like it wasn't that big of a deal. I want to make the quick comparison because people have asked a lot and say, "Well, how does it compare to Dune Imperium and Arnak?" Mm -hmm. Not comparable. No, they're right? really not. Because this is a worker placement first game. I agree. Mm -hmm. Only really. The yeah. cards are but, like extra things. Yeah, the cards are just boosts. The cards are addendums to what you're doing. Yeah. In those other games, you have to build up your deck of cards to be able to qualify to go to certain spots. Right. Not at all in this game. This game is more flexible in that mm -hmm. way, so you won't get decked out of right. going to a, a, the, the important spot. Just different. I love those other games. Yeah, they, right. I love the flexibility of this one, and I love the fact that the cards are multi-use so that you can... You know, it, no card is beholden to a certain action. You can use them to boost the labor on any action, mm -hmm. but you might get better bonuses if you focus on hunting. Once again, where some of the theme comes through for me, yeah. I got a lot of hunters in my deck. That hunting action is going to be really good for me. I'm going to have a lot more labor to spend on there. Mm -hmm. Or, during the Eclipse phase, I'm going to get more things related to, to that. that action. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of my favorite parts, is just how multi-use those tribe cards are. All right, so for me, the game is a seven, but when I use those modules, then I'll turn it into an eight. <laughs> and no, no, it's really that. Okay, so it's an eight yeah. for me. Um, again, I know that people are going to say that I don't like the game. I really do. I think an eight's like a I good said, score. Tom. An eight's a very <laughs> no, good score. I, I yeah. don't. Um, the like I said, it is a little procedural. It does leave me a little. I'm not going to say cold again, but yeah, that. Um, <laughs> but it's also really well designed. It's really well balanced. And the best way to tell that is when it's time for me to buy one of those five cards, I always sit there and go, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's good. It is good. One of those yeah. five cards you can buy is not better than the other ones. They all have their uses, and I'm not sure which one to take. Right. I also am like, what action am I going to take? Oh, I don't know. If there's only one with a bonus... That might be the one, but it feels like the actions are all useful. And like I said, once you add that bonus to resting, resting is use, is even more useful. Right. And the whole thing just, it flows together really well. It's a thinky game, mm -hmm. and I wish, I don't think I'll play it again with four. It wasn't tremendously awful with four, mm -hmm. but three feels like a nice sweet spot because yeah. I think the game... The downtime, since there is so much to think on a turn, and you can't plan your turn ahead as much because what other players do does fairly affect you. It They're going to hunt the animals you hunt. They're right. going to put their villages out in the area where you want to go to. They're going yep. to buy the culture card you want. So you can't plan that far ahead. And so four is just a little longer than I would want because you just have to kind of... You're just waiting around a bit right. more. But it's not egregious. Sure. That's so, almost a compliment for a heavier Euro game from you. Most of the time you say four... Out. I'll never Garden. play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends on the game. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, I'll, I'll play it with four, but I think I liked three is, is, is was a sweet spot. So anyway, eight for me. Okay. Um, I'm coming down. I'm going to give this one an 8.5. I like this one a lot. And uh, it, it's the way that I would say it, it's a very well-tuned game. Mm -hmm. It is a bit yes. procedural, but I'm okay with that. I tend to like heavier Euro games that do have some procedurality to them. This one... Like I said, it doesn't feel like a checklist of disparate things each turn. It feels like a good cohesive amount of, of well-tuned actions you're doing. I'm interested in the culture cards. I'm interested in more tribe cards. I'm interested in the village board. I'm interested in the tracks. I'm interested in the, in the megalith board. Every aspect of it is enticing, and I want to do all of it. And so now it's, how do I use this to my advantage? Uh, I think that... I think the development team on this one did a really good job. There's a few... Little touches like the the there's the five bonuses that are tiered, so and any time that you take one of those, like you can always do benefits. you can do a lesser benefit. Yeah, that's, that's very smart. Small touches like that that make me think, oh, this is this is not a tight restrictive game. This is kind of open. I really like a lot about what's going on here. I think setups a bit much. I think that it's kind of a table hog. Those things do affect, you know, uh, am I really going to play this that often? But man, I like it whenever it's out on the table. So eight point five for me. And uh, so this is where I was going to bring up these thoughts because uh, that I mentioned earlier. I feel like one of the disadvantages of mentioning how much you anticipate a game is that there is going to be a lot of assumptions made, right? That Always. No matter what, Mike giving us an eleven. You're going to love assumption. this game. No matter what, you're going to love this game. And and there are games that I have anticipated that I've been very very disappointed by. 
You know, and unfortunately, this isn't one of them. Uh, I wasn't disappointed at all. I'm giving it a nine. I, I'm giving it a nine. Wow, I'm so surprised. Well, look, but here's the thing. I, you knew I, you were like a yeah, 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 that's it. the thing. I'm, I'm kind of damned if I do, damned if I don't. But I, but I, I really do think this is an outstanding game. The, the negatives to it are, I agree with you. I think it's a little long. Uh, I think it's just a touch long, especially I think at, at four would, would make it the, you know, really getting to that edge. I think three is good, two is good. I don't even know. I could talk about the solo game. I played it. I liked it. Maybe I'll go into more detail in a future review. But this is a game that I think has a, a, a lot of elements that I like that come together very well. It is a game that has a ton of iconography that I feel like is very, very well done, very intuitive. Yeah. This is probably the heaviest game that I don't dread teaching. Uh, you know, this this will be a game that sure. at, a, at one of our conventions, if someone asks, hey, can you teach me Endless Winter? I'm not going to be like, oh, man, I'm going to have to spend 20 minutes in this rule book again. I feel like this is one that I could teach. I think I can teach it. Even if I weren't to play it for the next month, I could teach it a month from now. It makes sense to me. So as crazy as that sounds, that's a big deal for a game of this weight that, that, that it all comes together and makes sense in my brain. I look forward to playing it more. I look forward to teaching it more. It's a nine. Well, there you go, folks. That's Endless Winter. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Chris Yee. I'm Mike Delicio. Stay chilly. Ooh.